Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about um, building machine learning infrastructure on Apache Flink. We use Apache Flink as our main processing engine to generate um, inputs for our models. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Simba, uh, co-founder and CEO of a company called Stream SQL. Prior to this, I worked at Google. Um, I worked uh, on Google Wide Profiling, making search go faster, and I also worked on Cloud Data Store. Uh, left Google, started a company prior to this, um, but did all kinds of stuff around personalization, et cetera. Uh, well, we were actually powering personalization for 100 million monthly active users. Stream SQL is actually the kind of infrastructure we built for our machine learning um, or for the processing piece of our machine learning um, that we then rolled into its own product. So I'm going to start kind of high level um, of like machine learning. What are we even talking about? Where does Apache Flink fit into machine learning and in, in at least in feature store sense? Um, so the first thing to kind of understand, and if you do machine learning, this is all going to be very uh, 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 kind of low level. But um, you know, most people, when they think of machine learning, they think of the Coursera class, they think of all the linear algebra um, that you know you kind of get taught in that. In reality, very few people actually work on the on that level. Most people are working more at the level of um, using more general purpose models, like an SVM, uh, uh, even just a neural network. Their the architecture is kind of well established. Um, it has been proven to work. And then the focus becomes on how do I take my raw data and my domain knowledge and this generic model and build some system that works. So a lot of it is contextualizing your raw data to the model. So I'm gonna use the word feature, like a feature store. When I say feature, all I mean is an input to a machine learning model. And so that kind of system between the raw data to that input, the final input that's processed and ready to go into the model, that's where we use Apache Flink. And that's kind of where I'll focus on. That part of, um, of a machine learning system is typically the part that takes the most amount of time. It's always a headache. Um, it actually drives lots of most of the results in the early days when you're putting a new model in production. Um, lots of the easiest gains you can make in terms of model productivity and how, how well the model works comes from actually feature engineering. Coming up with better representations of the problem you're trying to solve to give to a general purpose model. So it kind of looks like this, like you, you, you um, um, come up with an idea, like, hey, I think that the length of time someone reads an article on average is going to help me predict if they'll subscribe. And I'll generate training data set out of it, validate it, and then deploy in production. This is where we were driving most of our gains in our machine learning models. So this is where we spent most of our time, and it's where we got most of our ROI. So our focus became on how do we Essentially, how do we cut the cycle down, speed the cycle up so we can do more feature engineering cycles in a less amount of time? To contextualize, we were spending a huge majority of our time building and maintaining data pipelines for these features. And it always felt like our pipelines and our whole system to do that was kind of like a house of cards. Like it always felt like some a small thing would come in that could uh, take the whole system down. Um, to be clear about kind of what our end goal is. So we start with raw data that could be anywhere. It can be an S3, it can be just an, kind of all over your data lake. Um, we want to end up with two things for machine learning. One is the online features. So we have um, we have these features, again, features just inputs to a model. And we want to be able to get the values of those inputs um, pretty much in real time. I want to know the current value. Like if I want to recommend something to you and I'm Spotify, I want to know what you're listening to right now. I want to know what you listen to right before then, et cetera. So I'm able to give a user ID and get back all the features I need for my model to serve. The other thing I need is point in time correct training data. I'll go deeper into what point in time correct means. But generally, if I am training a model, I'm giving it like kind of things you did in the past and, and the inputs that the model would have gone at that at those points in time. If I don't do that correctly, I might 
end up trying to recommend what you were listening to two years ago using what you are listening to right now, which tip, which is a whole different problem than the problem that we're actually training the model to solve, which is given what I'm listening to now, what am I going to listen to next? So generating these two kind of artifacts that we need, um, there's three main problems that we have to solve. One is having near real time online features, which we I just kind of spoke on. Like I want to know all the values of these features right now. I can't do it in batch per day because then, you know, if today you're in like an 80s mood and you're listening to music and I'm trying to recommend music, um, I'm gonna do a bad job because um, I'm only gonna be able to use, you know, what you were listening to yesterday or whatever. I need to bootstrap stateful features. I'll describe more in depth what that means, but generally if I have a feature that's stateful, um, I need to be able to kind of backfill all, all its, its current values for each user. And then finally, like I mentioned, the point in time correct, training that up, which um, I'll, I'll kind of dive into. So these are the three things I'm gonna speak on. The first one is actually the easiest one, near real time online features. Um, this is something that Flink is super, super good for. And um, you know, it's, it's uh, almost, uh, don't really have to speak much on it. Flink is built from the ground up for stream processing. If we have a stream of, of, of input data, we have a Flink job that can turn that into uh, kind of an aggregation uh, of, for each user, the features of, of um, each, for each model for each user. The second problem is a stateful problem. In this example I gave, almost every input feature is stateful. Um, like last five articles read is stateful, top category that a user reads is stateful, um, total time spent reading is stateful. So I need to maintain these things. The, it's easy to maintain them. Like Flink kind of does that for you. If you write a Flink job that, um, that you know, builds these things and keep that job running, then it will continue to run. It'll keep all these things up to date. The hard part is the backfill. If I want, for example, if I want total time spent reading and I write a job that, or some sort, let's say it's like Flink SQL and I write a SQL query that generates total time spent reading. If I run that right now, I will get the total time spent reading per user right now, like, like starting from now. Um, which means if I'm trying to, again, iterate really quickly, I might have to wait three months before I have enough data to actually test this feature out. And a lot of companies actually do that. Like they have, they will wait three months to touch a feature and they'll just kind of, every time they come up with an idea, they'll, they'll uh, uh, you know, write a job for it, collect data, and then in three months when it's done, they'll actually go and test it. We were able to make that happen much, much faster by essentially fitting together Kafka with S3, um, with kind of a custom adapter the, the main concept here, the only thing you really, that, that they're really the like kind of part to understand. I mean, the, the real problem is speech, batch and stream processing. Now I have S3 that has all the past events. I have a stream of all new events. So I need to kind of unify these. The trick we kind of had was more of a data structure problem. Essentially, we just made it look like a, a, a ledger. It's like it's kind of a log and you keep appending to one end and the other end is immutable. The cool thing about that is that if you cut at an arbitrary point and just read everything that's happened, it looks like a batch job or a batch you know, data set. If you only read from the end, it looks like a streaming problem. If you were able to mix the two together um, with one job or one kind of piece of logic, you end up with something that unifies batch and streaming, um, which kind of solves our bootstrapping problem. So now if we create a new feature, we not only run it on you know all new events coming into Pulsar, Kafka, or whatever, but we also um, run it across all events we've seen in S3. This is kind of an idea of what the architecture looks like. Um, so we use Pulsar, which allows us to automatically um, offload like uh, old events into S3. So it kind of gives us infinite retention in a way that actually scales. Um, obviously, Flink um, for our processing. Um, we use Redis, Cassandra, and a few other things for our um, actual feature serving at the end. Um, so this kind of becomes the basic um, um, infrastructure that we use um, for our uh, feature pipelines. So the third problem is point-in-time correct training data. 
the thing here is let's say, you know, a year ago I was reading a specific article. Um, I would have features which are inputs to the model. And for me to train correctly, the way it works is I take the features, I give it to the model, I, it predicts what I'm going to read next. Then I give it what I actually read and then it learns from that. Um, from either it's a mistake or if it was right, then it doesn't do anything. Um, and um, um, so the thing here is that you have to make sure that the features are what they would have been at that point in time. So, you know, this is an example of like some SQL code of how you could do that, um, which is, for example, if I want the name and value, you know, a feature name, feature value at a specific time. Um, the thing is that, you know, it's up to that time. It's not necessarily like there will be a feature value at that time. I want the last value of the feature. So I need to do this kind of crazy logic of like, hey, you know, this is the max time. Find the closest value of the feature to that max time. Um, and that is what I'm looking, that's the, the value of the feature right now. Now, the cool thing that Flink has that we've kind of um, been able to leverage to make this logic way easier is temporal tables. A temporal table ingests a key value time, kind of like a triplet. And now I can do kind of a key value lookup like you would, but I can also give it time, which will give me what was the value of this key at that point in time. That's like, literally the logic we need. It makes its perfect fit for um, the point in time correctness problem. So generating training data. Um, right now it can only be used in joins, but that's exactly what we need anyway, because we would have some sort of like data set, which is the reads here, which I'm trying to predict. And then I can join it with a temporal table, which is the features and I magically get point in time correct training data. Um, so this is kind of an example of that. So again, I have the label, I have the time of when that thing happened, and then I can get the features at that point in time and kind of loop through the whole thing. Um, so the processing problem is solved now. So um, that got us, that made us move significantly faster um, in terms of just our ability to get features out, get new iterations of our models out, and made things much easier and also less bug prone. Because we kind of unified batch and streaming um, you didn't have to write complex logic for point in time correct training data. Like you kind of worked as you would expect to, and the system kind of magically would generate all of um, the specific problems that you would need to solve for it to work in a machine learning system for us. Um, this got us most of the way there. For other problems that kind of came up, we started to think of features as kind of the building blocks of these machine learning models. Like we could reuse, um, we could reuse some of the features that we built for other models. The problem here became kind of slightly different. It wasn't necessarily like, how do we process these features? It became, how do we manage these features? Um, and so the problem was essentially that data scientists start to kind of work like lone wolves. Um, everyone would build their own pipelines. Um, they would own their own pipeline end to end. And what we really wanted was something that works more like software engineering, where people can kind of work together and collaborate and start using other people's features, other people's pipelines, and have a single source of truth for these things. Um, so on top of this system that we built on top of uh, Flink, Cassandra, Pulsar, we kind of built a handful of, of, of tools that were built around collaboration, and we made the API a bit more strict. So for example, everything's immutable. Um, features are defined as a DAG. Um, you know, some for data scientists, especially like data analysts, like they weren't really comfortable working with Flink. So, you know, they could just write SQL and we would transform it into Flink SQL for them. Um, and we got ver versioning monitoring built in, and then we were leveraging the same uh, processing tools that we just talked about um, in Flink that gave us the black film point in time correct training data for us. So we kind of built on top of that main processing engine to build more of a data science platform on top of that problem. Um, and that there's other problems that come up of like people we work with around banks, et cetera, around governance, et cetera. There's like a lot of other problems that kind of sit above the processing that we also have to solve. And so we've kind of wrapped all that together into a feature store, um, Stream SQL, that I'm happy to speak. Um, if you're interested in learning about feature stores more deeply or talking about Stream SQL, um, feel free um, to send me an email. Um, otherwise, uh, is there any questions I can answer?